Last week we did something a little bit different by having the conversation be between me and two other people. This one we go even weirder. I decided to take you out on the road with me, literally. I had been working with Mike Metley on some research for some articles for Recording Magazine, where he's uh, the editor, and it just got to be too much. We just had to get out of the house, we had to go get some food, and I decided that I wanted to interview him for the podcast. So we took my, what I thought at the time to be trusty Tascam DR-07 Mark II, stuck it in the cup cup holder of the truck and on a rainy evening in May in in the Colorado Mountains we kicked off this interview. Now we're all over the map here and we had some technical issues which you'll hear me squawk about and so um, I actually had to break off the recording a couple of times. What you'll hear is this sound and that'll mean that we had some break in time when either we fixed technical problems or got some Indian food or moved from the truck to the house or whatever. It's also the longest interview that I've ever done, but it's because Mike has a, has a lot of knowledge that he's interested in sharing, but also because he has a tendency to get distracted a bit too, which is fun. And so we kind of go for a wheeling ride through most of the early internet interactions uh, for electronic musicians and also to have a discussion about how social media either does or does not improve your life. I think Mike would suggest that the answer is does not. But nevertheless, um, I hope you enjoy this podcast. It's a long one clocking in at just under um, hour 25 minutes. But it's also pretty interesting. And again, I apologize for the quality of the sound. My little recorder did not do me proud. Um, Although half of it was recorded in my basement. So, or in my studio. I didn't call it a basement. Um, So the quality is a little bit better there. But I hope you enjoy it. And I will talk to you at the end of the podcast. This week... I'm going to be interviewing uh, my friend Mike Metley. Mike is a, uh, he's got one hell of a background. I actually met him from Tallahassee, Florida in 1995. Yeah, about to have his first child. And second album. I'm not sure which was making me more nervous. <laughs> and um, my most strong memories from that visit are two. One, that he drives like an insane man. And secondly, we ate at a place uh, Jamaican food place and uh, he chided me for having pennies in the tip. I was just like throwing change on a table but and so I got the discipline I so desperately needed. And I got to show off what a completely micromanaging jerk I was. Yeah there you go. So um, but Mike has got a really interesting background. Interesting there's a word again. Uh, Mike's got a really great background to kind of plum because he's been around for a long time and he especially because he was sort of on the bleeding edge of the electronic music community and its instantiation in the internet now when i interviewed nick rothwell we talked a little bit about it and kind of some of the fun history of like being able to tell exactly which computer a person was on because of the routing records on the email that you sent or whatever but I wanted to talk to Mike uh, a little more thoroughly about the about the whole e-music internet world because he had some lists that he maintained. He did both e-music L and synth L, right? Uh, yeah. Right, which are two they mailing were, lists. They were two mailing lists that were being sponsored on the list server at AUVM, which was the big uh, Bax mainframe cluster at the American University in Washington, D.C. Okay, all right. That's... That's how I always wondered how American was involved, and that makes that makes more sense. Yeah, they they actually had a bunch of lists on all manner of uh, of topics, but the ones that were specifically uh, of interest to us, of course, were eMusicL, which was an academic list talking about the the theory, practice, and uh, 
more high-end idea space of electronic music and synth L uh, got spun off years later as a place for people to basically geek out about gear right which uh the internet seems particularly wired to deal with, don't you think? Well, <laughs> um, the, uh, the the world has always had people who are fascinated by technology, and, and the internet just lets them find each other a little quicker. Right. Uh, <laughs> so my so before eMusic L, and then it subsequently Synth L, what was there a community on the internet that found itself somehow? Well, or was that really the the launch point? Well, eMusic L was important for a couple of reasons. Uh, let me start off by telling you a, a, little, a little story that you might find amusing, which was when I first changed careers and started working uh, at Recording Magazine. Uh, among the people that I got to know in the office was a new production manager who was a young lady, a Boulder native very smart, competent uh, person, but hadn't really had a whole lot of tech experience. And one day I was chatting with her about this and that, and she got onto the politics of indigenous nations having their, their culture and their rituals wiped out by tides of external people with a lot of money coming in and basically paving their homes. And she was saying how you know she would never ever want to be a member of a community that did that to someone and i said how do you get on the internet and she said america online why <laughs> and she didn't know why i was laughing <laughs> because of course in the, the days monsters, <laughs> in, in the days before aol and before the web before these communities existed there were these mailing lists that were founded and run in the infant internet. And these were big clusters of mainframe computers that were located generally at universities or government offices and nets that were uh, not really connected to one another in what we would nowadays call the internet. You had BitNet, which was uh, a way of connecting universities and academic locations. You had Milnet, which was running between um, uh, military installations. Right. You had uh, GovNet, which was fairly small, but that was you know government offices. In case you haven't noticed, first of all, we're doing this interview while we're driving. Second of all, we had some technical problems because apparently an iPhone 5 near a uh, Tascam DS07, is that what it is? DR07 Mark II. Uh, apparently, that's a lethal combination. So, we're, we're done with that. <laughs> Cell phone off. So, anyway, you were talking about like BitNet and GovNet. And right, and, and ARPANET, of course, uh, being the original, original that uh, some people still had uh, ARPANET addresses. So, you know, if you cast your mind back to the early 80s, this is a situation before we had the, what we call now the internet. Right. Because these nets weren't connected to one another except via very specific machines called gateways. Right. So if you wanted to talk to somebody or send somebody an email, what you had to do was you would, at the, well, way early on, you'd have bang paths where you would actually trace a route and you would have to know exactly which computer could talk to which computer and you would jump from stone to stone across the pond to get to somebody. Right. But, you know, then eventually they had gateways where if you wanted to get to Milnet, you had to know that there was a particular gateway address and you would aim your email at that gateway and then it would know how to uh, parse out the email address. So it was a very different kind of a culture. And the reason I bring all of this up is not just because of the fact that it was difficult for people to talk to one another and to find central locations for this kind of information, which we take for granted these days. What was more important was that there was a real self-selection process in who was on the internet in the first place. All right. The average punter who was interested in getting online generally belonged to a bulletin board service. 
and you had you know these self-contained uh, communities, online communities. So you had the well in in the Bay Area, and you had, um, had CompuServe. CompuServe. What was the one that? Genie. Uh, yeah, Genie. But what was the one that was? It was almost more like a bulletin board than anything. That was done by some of the electronic music magazines at the time. Um, oh, that um, that was the well, the whole Earth Electronic League, no, no, wasn't no. it? There was another one, and uh, uh, <laughs> no, we'll we'll figure it out and come back to it. But yeah, it was like I remember that uh, Craig Anderton was on it, and you could actually like like communicate with people from Motu or some of these other places. But it was. It was a dial-up thing, you know. And and, uh, and you would leave messages and hear right. back. Because, of course, back then, you know, if you got 5,600 baud, you were living large. Right. Well, and also, you paid by the minute. So there was no way you could sit on it all day and have anything close to a real-time exchange. It just wasn't happening. And you'd the, leave a message, and you'd come back tomorrow and check to see if anyone... Had answered. Right. Exactly. And the whole concept of email was, was still being developed at the time. Right. Um, so what was interesting was that there was a particular network that came along in the mid 80s called Usenet. And Usenet was a, we're better than you are because our operating system is smarter than yours, so yan 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 network, which basically connected Unix mainframes around the world. Right. It was a, a common uh, framework. And by the way, for all of you people out there who are older than I am and who lived through this. If I'm getting stuff wrong, um, send, send, send any complaints to DevNull. <laughs> um, the point is that, that Usenet had the ability to network information and to have shared databases of basically, they were like email posts, but they were the nascent news groups. And so what you had on the Usenet networks, anybody with a, a Unix machine or a machine that was capable of attaching via a gateway to a Unix machine had the ability to get to these networks and they would have uh, subject matter and then you would have a dot and then a sub uh, a subtopic and then a sub subtopic. So you would have, you know, for instance, uh, rec were the recreational news right. groups right. and so you would have rec.music which was a general music discussion news group but then under that you would have rec.music.synth which was the group for electronic musicians and then you would have rec.music.makers which was the one for people who used acoustic and electric instruments right. and then somebody came along and tried to legislate the uh, the hierarchy of these things so they said that rec music synth shouldn't be its own group and it became rec.music.makers.synth oh, okay. and that confused everybody because then nobody was going <laughs> to shut down rec music synth and so they ended up splitting the audience um, and this, I totally forgot about using it I don't know yeah. how because I spent hours of my employer's time uh, oh, sitting yeah. there gawking at Usenet. Oh yeah, well, you know, I mean, I mean, and, and there were some really famous groups. I mean, some of the early, the, the very early uh, comp uh, groups where people would share information about operating systems. Right. Um, and then, you know, of course, you know, human civilization being what it is, the second group created was all sex, all sex right. you know, and everything that <laughs> came in there. Um, and then you would have the alt fan groups, which were fans of music or art or movies or literature or whatever would hang out. Um, it was an enormous hierarchy. And by today's standards, the entire output of that network would probably fit on somebody's hard drive without any trouble at all. Right. But back then, it was gobs of data oh, flying so around, right and you'd log in and you'd connect to the Usenet news groups. And uh, there would be a um, there would be a, a plethora of messages in the groups that you were subscribed to that you would then read through and comment on, and it was just presented as this one long running stream of topics and answers and things like that. I mean, probably the closest thing in today's world to something like that would be uh, a Facebook timeline or a right. Twitter timeline because today's forums are much better organized. There was right. no such thing as threading 
right. for a long time. Eventually, threading got added, but then what you had was you had people whose computers supported threading and people whose computers <laughs> didn't, yeah. and then folks would complain if you wandered off topic. Right. Uh, it was a mess. But in amongst all of that, you had a very specific community of people with specific interests who were finding one another, and because this wasn't something that anybody could get onto, it was something where you had to have a certain degree of technical savvy, you had to have a certain degree of knowledge, and you had to have connections. And I don't mean that in, in a literal sense, I mean that in a metaphorical sense. If you weren't at a university, right. or at a military base, or at a national laboratory, or something of that level, you didn't have access to a mainframe computer. Nobody had a vax in their basement. Right. Right. And so, it was either the bulletin board systems, which were, you know, available to anyone and everyone, but which tended to be limited to these sort of technology forward geeks who liked having a, a Commodore 64 on their desk, um, you know, the ancestors of modern, right. ch modern chip tunes, uh, or you're talking about an academic or military computer science community. And that's a pretty intense filter. If you start with those people, the level of discourse is going to be pretty high. You're not going to have your average 14-year-old logging on and wondering where to pick up chicks or if anybody has a place to download, you know, the like a Skrillex album. The, well, or you know, we're, well, we're talking. Time. Well, we're at, at the time. <laughs> at, at the, the time, time, latest Yes album. Well, no, actually, <laughs> but remember. People didn't download music. Right, that's the, the, the bandwidth was too slow, and nobody stored yeah. music on hard disks anyway. Right. No, no, no. Back then, it was downloading uh, uh, line printer porn. Yeah, yeah. So you could print out pictures of naked women on a teletype. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're talking serious technology here. It was a very fertile ground for discussions of music and creativity and technology to take root and for people to make an effort to connect with one another and, and, and sort of get in each other's heads. And a lot of the etiquette and a lot of the behavior that we take for granted nowadays as part of how the internet works was still being developed. So it was, it was a fascinating time because we were not only learning what we wanted to talk to about, uh, one another about, but we were also, we were creating the language. Right. Well, now, to what extent do you think that sort of that self-selection process also led to sort of the heavy gear geek level part of it and and also the fact that you were either working for somebody with these connections or you were wealthy enough to have access to them? Well, every technology starts out in the hands of people who are wealthy enough to afford it. Right. And the beautiful thing about the information age versus the space age and before that the age of transportation and before that the age of industry uh industry yeah <laughs> sorry um was that the time from it's brand new and only a few people have it to it's everywhere was greatly compressed right you know you didn't have a whole generation where only the rich and famous had something by the time we got old enough to have kids, it was everywhere. Right. And so there was an initial self-selection process which produced a kind of a ferment for the, the, the sort of creativity that went on. But as fondly as we look back and remember it, we have to remember that it was only a few years. We're talking 1983, 1984, really until um, 95 which is when AOL and the web really exploded. Right. And then everybody got involved, which is at, on the one hand a really good thing, and on the other hand, that was what gave rise to my joke when I was talking to this woman and she was talking about the indigenous culture being wiped out. Right. Because we had had this very tight community of well-educated, intelligent people who did things a certain way, and all of a sudden, the digital doors got battered down, and anyone with a $100 computer and a modem could get online and express their opinion. Mm -hmm. And that is both a good and a bad thing. Uh, you know, democracy is wonderful, but 
participatory democracy like they had in ancient Greece only works if you're talking about a number of people the size of your average Greek city. Right. When you start talking about a country or the planet, the planet, it, it, it you know, and, and we're seeing it nowadays with, with Twitter and Facebook and, and Instagram and Reddit, everyone's talking at once. Yeah. And the one thing about the mailing lists and Usenet is that, especially the mailing list for AUVM, they had community standards because they were part of a university that had a charter that had to answer to a board of trustees. And they were moderated. Right. And if somebody got off topic or, you know, said something that didn't fit with what people were trying to learn, they went away. They, because They were sent back in here. You, you made them go away. And in fact, the great the great uh, destruction of the early hierarchy came when someone came along who had a very deliberate agenda to push the envelope of what they were and were not allowed to say and who brought in the whole question of freedom of speech and freedom of expression versus oppressive moderation of, uh, of discourse on these forums and this one person single-handedly destroyed some of the early forums and you know who i'm talking about yes i do our friend auntie york slash nn oh yes yeah. and and we to this day we don't know who he or she is or whether it was more than one person or where they lived they were the first of the great internet creative community cyber criminals yeah. auntie Orp did an album it's actually quite good. I actually have a copy. Um, although, <laughs> whenever I listen to it, good I always... Is, good is, is... It's interesting. It I is ve it's very interesting. It is very interesting. And and what was it that... Uh, what was it that, that Nick Rothwell said about it? He said, um, I wanted to turn it off, but by track 57, I couldn't move. <laughs> It was it was noise. It was it was it was very early sample chopping, um, and uh, really random, really heavy duty stuff. But over and above that, there were also things like websites with code that was designed to open windows outside your browser, right. and oh, you know, and, it, it, and you know, you would crash computers. Right. I mean, Andy Orp really made an effort and basically said. I am expressing myself, I am creating art, I'm being creative, and these people are stifling me. Right. And in fact, there was an entire news group created specifically, <laughs> we, we, we didn't want to admit it to ourselves, it was a collection of list owners of other ma uh, mailing lists and, and uh, news groups that dealt with creative technology to talk about issues of governance and freedom of information. And what none of us wanted to admit was that it was an Andy Orp support right, group. Right, right. Because yeah. James McCartney was, was yeah. on it. I was Max on it. Max at McGill. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Tom Herb right. was on it. I was on it. Uh, Joe McMahon was on it because he was helping out with eMusicL at the okay. time. And uh, basically, we all just got on there to, to bitch about Andy Orp <laughs> and to wonder what to do. And to give each other support when, you know... Because there's always going to be people coming out of the woodwork. And uh, it's, you know, woodwork squeaks out come the freaks. Uh, Andy, Orp, <laughs> Andy Orp inspired a lot of people to ask these important, relevant questions. Right. But what it really came down to at some point was the discussion of the questions became everything and people stopped talking about music. Yeah, that's, that's right. And it was sort of, it, it was, it was it sad. Was, yeah. <laughs> So, um, we kind <laughs> this of... This is going to be the weirdest transcript <laughs> this, this of any of these be. podcasts. Um, so we had a chance to kind of talk about how the Usenet groups kind of did what they did, and it actually led to some, you know, if you're being dis... or non-generous, you would say antisocial behavior, but it was, in a way, artistic behavior, too. Well, yes. this or is an a, attempt, anyway. Well, this is a, this is a creative group of people who were learning a new way to talk to one another right. and for folks who are technology forward as electronic creators often are and for folks who are looking for new ways to press technology into use 
uh, as electronic creators often are. It was a very exciting time. It was a great, great way to to not work when you were on the job. <laughs> right. um, and you know, if if the the folks at the Oak Ridge National Lab um, are listening to this. Um, you can suck me because I figured out a way to use your gateway to get to a spark station at the University of Pittsburgh where you couldn't censor my emails anymore. <laughs> so, ha! <laughs> well, and, speaking uh, of email though, I want to talk about <laughs> the development of email lists after Usenet because to me, that was the first... Well, they were in parallel. They were in parallel. Well, they were in parallel, but I felt like, uh, for me at least, mailing lists really quickly surpassed the Usenet because the conversations could be almost real time. I'd say something and there were enough people sitting at their machines so that I would get an instantaneous or almost instantaneous response. Uh -huh. And also, the other thing that happened was that developed the kind of community where Buying and selling gear seemed to be able to happen. It didn't seem to work in a in a Usenet environment. Well, that's an interesting thing. I'm not sure how true that is. You would occasionally get gear for sale stuff, but you would, because of the way it worked, um, there was no private conversation in Usenet. And that may actually be the key. A mailing list, especially in the old days when you had lists that didn't hide addresses. Right. A mailing list exposed you as a person at a, sitting at a computer to the world. Right. You were who you were. Um, you could log on to a Usenet news group from anywhere. And, you know, maybe people could figure out how to get back to you. Maybe they couldn't. One of the things that people used to like to do was spoofing uh, uh, email addresses. And um, there was that sense of anonymity. The other thing that you had back in those days was you had these great uh, intellectual freedom fighters of the 90s where there was a fellow, I, I don't remember what the name of the server was, but there was a fellow in Finland who basically ran a server. All it did was it took in uh, posts to Usenet news groups and it stripped out your personal data and put in an anonymous tag. So you could have perfect anonymity. You could do anything, say anything on the internet without any fear of repercussions from your government right. because no one knew who you were. Even the guy who owned the server, the, the, the encryption algorithm was such that he himself didn't know who anybody was. And what ended up happening was the, the Finnish government ended up forcing him to take it down. And you know we've never had privacy since, but the, the fact is, on an email list, you were who you were, and it was very easy to take a conversation off a mailing list and go to private mail if right. that was necessary. And yes, one of the things that that made it very handy to do was buy and sell gear. That was really the golden age for electronic musicians who were trying to get their hands on, on gear that nobody wanted anymore simply because it was easy to find people who had it or, or who knew people who had it. And there wasn't yet this pervasive understanding of what things were worth. So there were still deals to be had if you were careful. And, you know, just the other day I went to a pawn shop and they had an absolutely gorgeous mint mini cork. They wanted $650 for it because they knew they could get $650 for it. And when you looked a little closer, there was a little sticker on the price tag that said, as featured on Craigslist. Right. Well, hurry for us. 20 years ago, if you found a great deal on a keyboard that nobody wanted anymore, it was a way to build up a studio and to get yourself a set, a palette of tone colors that you could work with without breaking your back. And we were helped along by the fact, of course, that analog was not cool anymore, and that only digital was cool, and that people were throwing away analog gear for practically nothing. This was long before 
the resurgence of the vintage movement. Right. And I regularly got laughed at on eMusic L because I had a bunch of analog gear that I refused to sell. And, you know, it's very funny. Nowadays I get looked at as sort of, you know, one of these great stalwarts who kept the flame. <laughs> and frankly, these days I almost all the stuff I do is digital. Right. So, you know, there you are. Well, it was, it was interesting though because you say that people were really into, you know, that digital was cool, analog was uncool. But there started to be sort of this groundswell um, that eventually became the mailing list analog heaven. Yes. And the one thing I remember, again, and there are should, so many... We should point out, though, that digital hell started at the same time. <laughs> and at the beginning, Digital Hell had just as many members as Analog yeah. Heaven did. So, you know, it was it was, it was was even at the start, but you're right. Analog Heaven was an important piece of evolution. Well, and I, for me, myself, and again, I have so many personal memories of this stuff. Uh -huh. And one of the things that, sort of like the analog and vintage movement, and you know, we say, we call it vintage now, Back then it wasn't vintage, it was just old gear. Yeah, it was junk. It was junk. But what I remember was that I could buy a piece of junk from someone for 200 bucks. Uh-huh. Which was a high price for one of the junk pieces, right? But oh, yeah. Let's say that I'm getting a, oh, I don't know, I get a Pro 1 for 150 bucks uh -huh. or, or something like that. Uh-huh. And I would have so much fun with it. Well, yes. But I would read the magazines like Keyboard and EM at the time, and it's like, oh, you know, you have to get the brand new uh, Wizzy, Pick a year. Wizzy thing. Pick a year. Pick I, a can year. Tell, I can tell you what the flavor of the year All was. Right. Let's call it 90, 94. 94, the Roland D series was uh, going away. The U series were morphing into the XP. Workstations, oh, that's right. yes. Uh, samplers, yeah, JV ten eighty, yep, and, yep. and and the JD eight hundred right. was around in the early nineties. Yeah. Um, that was all, it, and the JD eight hundred was the supreme irony. It was a digital sample playing yeah. synth that had all the controls of an analog I synth. I love that machine. Oh, it's a great, great <laughs> keyboard. And uh, and at the same time, then you also had sixteen bit samplers were everywhere, right. and you started seeing digital audio on computers. Right. Pro well, Tools was right. just just becoming viable. But for me, I would I would get this cheap Pro One. Yep. And I would have so much more fun with it than the than the what the full page ad for the U220 told me I was going to have. Yep. Very true. And um and it started it was sort of like a a very kind of an almost anti-commercial thing that I went through, which was like these ads, they're lying to me. You know? Well, yes. And, and I mean, because... now that's sort of like a common trope, right? But at the time, magazines were important at the time because that was the only way to get information for, about stuff, right? Except the mailing lists. Except the mailing lists. And then all of a sudden, the mailing lists became more trustworthy to me than the magazines. Because you were hearing from like-minded people who didn't have an economic stake in what you decided. Right, right. And this is, this is where the story gets interesting because... E-Music L, a lot of the academic music programs that were on the list were still teaching with analog gear. It was what they had. Right. It was what was available, and it was a good pedagogical tool because a subtractive synthesizer is a very straightforward thing to learn to use. A modular can be tremendously complicated. But a semi-modular or non-modular analog synth, or a modular that's been set up with a very straightforward voicing, is a very good way to learn the basics of tone shaping. Well, and it's reductive in a way that's really educational. Exactly. And you were doing creative synth, and I was creating reactor patches right. for you yeah. to put up on, uh, on, on the site. I was working in reactor and, and doing... Uh, essentially subtractive synthesis as a way of learning how to do things. Right. Reactor lets you do a whole lot more. In version 2.5 is a little more limited than it is now. But oh, you remember could, when it was generator? Oh yeah. Oy, oy. And uh, the, the point is though, it, you could teach with these tools. They were simple, they were straightforward, they were understandable. And everybody succumbed to some extent to the lure of digital. Yeah. I mean, 
Gary Nelson at Oberlin bought a bunch of DX9s because FM was the wave of the future. And 4-op actually is simple enough so that you could really learn to program it and do things with it that was that yeah, were very was, cool. Yeah, and it was it, you could at least intellectualize it fairly quickly. Yeah, a, 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 a four-operator synthesizer with, you know, a, a limited number of ways that the operators can interact is something that even an analog head who is used to the way analog synths work could figure out how to do basic stuff with. Right. And so, from a pedagogical standpoint, that was worthwhile. But once you learned how to use a 4-op FM synthesizer, guess what you knew how to do? You knew how to do 4-op FM. No. Whereas, frequency modulation as a subject is something you could do with an analog synthesizer. Analog was bigger than that. You could do more with it. Once you got the basics under your belt, you added a module or you... Uh, you, you, you stretched out a little bit and there was there was room to grow right. and the mailing lists were a great place for that because you had people helping each other learn how this stuff all went together and if somebody came up with a really cool technique that they found creatively inspiring they would get on eMusicL or Synthel and they would say look what I just did and in the 80s, when there was very little in the way of instantaneous communication and even less in the way of ultra-specialized communication for particular types of gear, now every manufacturer has a, a, a forum. Right. But in the old days, that information was hard to come by. And I hate to sound like a Luddite here, but in the 80s, when I wanted to reach people to teach about the Oberheim Expander, I printed a newsletter and I mailed it out <laughs> right. four times a year. Right. Expansions was how I got my start in the industry, teaching people and helping people teach each other. Right. That was the whole beauty of eMusicL and Synthel. Synthel very quickly became a swap meet, and that's okay. People didn't have a problem with it because the joke we used to make was, yeah, it's, it is all about the gear. <laughs> but eMusicL was a valuable place for people to say, this is what I'm doing in my musical creativity right now. What do you think? And I just got this album. And it sounds to me like this person who used to be very original is now resorting to cliches because they're relying on their gear too much. What right. do you think? And a lot of these early tropes that we now really take for granted, the idea of the gear dictating how you compose, the idea of multitudinous options leading to paralysis, the idea of old versus new gear being good or bad, whether or not you want to be leading edge, or whether it's better to hang back and work with stuff that's been understood and has had the bugs worked out of it. The concept of the end user being forced to beta test gear right. because the manufacturer wants to bring it to market and is unwilling to wait until it's ready. Yeah. These are things that are just part of our language now. They're part of our vocabulary. But in the 80s, we were learning it and we were teaching it to each other. Well, yeah. One of the places where that really struck home for me that was one, one of the things that I tend to have a tendency to rail on and on about is this idea of virtuosity with your instrument, regardless of what it is. I remember us having those discussions on eMusic L and when the idea of could you be a virtuoso of a drum machine actually had to be debated because people were like, well, you know, there was a group of people that said, you're not physically playing. There's not a, you know, there's not a physical part of this that's required for something that you would say is virtuo virtuosity. And there were other people that say, but it's an instrument that makes sound, and it has, and and the sounds that it's making are valid, and it's your responsibility to learn, you know, how to do the rhythms and how to make the sounds work right and all this stuff. And I remember having those discussions, and and it opening my mind to think differently about 
about the work that we were doing, the, the, the musical work, the learning work that we were doing. It was, uh, that was an amazing, amazing resource. And what I would say uh, in support of that is that this was when we really began as a community of people who did not go to Darmstadt and study under Stockhausen to understand the idea that there's physical virtuosity and there's mental virtuosity. Mm -hmm. And it is possible to take a machine that does not necessarily have an extremely fine-grained physical interface and still become virtuoso with it by learning the parameter space that this instrument represents and mastering it. And that was a two-edged sword because what you had was somebody like Wendy Carlos who stated famously, any parameter that can be controlled must be controlled. If you do not exert conscious control over every parameter of a machine at your disposal, then you're letting the machine do the work. Right. And on a Moog synthesizer, when uh, switched on box, switched on Brandenburg's sonic seasonings, time steps, you know, the Clockwork Orange right. soundtrack, were the Vogue, there was that sense of complete mastery of the headspace yeah. really being yeah. under her control. Then she discovered digital synthesis and she discovered alternate tunings. And suddenly she was working with the, uh, the Synergy and the, uh, the Krumar uh, General Development System, mm -hmm. which were these open-ended digital synthesizers programmed from K-Pro computers uh, that had thousands and thousands of parameters. And she put out a couple of brilliant albums, Digital Moonscapes and then Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. And then she vanished. She completely vanished because she could no longer follow her own dictum about headspace. Yeah. She had to control everything. And, and it became overwhelming. It became completely overwhelming. And, you know, mad props to Wendy. She's still alive. She's still out there. She's, she's a wonderful woman, and she has done work that all of us should, you know, burn incense in front of a statue of her for. But she was a victim of the march of technology. And for a while, technology was at a point where you either were crushed under it or you surfed on it. And MIDI and the arrival of affordable digital synthesis and the arrival of sequencing took a lot of bands that had made this virtuosity in the headspace with modular instruments, their, their stock and trade, and turned them into preset players. Right. You know, you can point to the series of three or four albums in the mid-1980s when Tangerine Dream stopped being interesting yeah. because they didn't master their gear anymore and it wasn't that the machinery had advanced beyond them or that they had gotten lazy it was the vocabulary had expanded beyond what they knew and in attempting to speak the new language they were talking baby talk yeah. um, the flip side of this was if you had an instrument that was tremendously rare electronic limited edition something that you may or may not uh, you know, see very many of, and you got really, really good with it, up to and including physical virtuosity, you ran into a situation where you become a dinosaur. Yeah. And the classical example of that, of course, is Oscar Sala right. and the Troutonium. Right, right. Because the mixture of Troutonium you know, was used on Hitchcock movies and you know, God knows what all else, but Sala himself said, before he died, I have a couple of students who are good, but they're not me. And when I die, this instrument is going into a museum and it's going to vanish and no one will ever make these sounds again. It is very rare that an instrument of our century with this sort of technological um, uh, limitation, if you will, survives. Generally, when it does, you have to have a very unique combination of uh, a beauty and expressiveness that makes it worth saving 
and the level of technical simplicity that makes it easy to save. And the classic example of that is the theremin. Right. Because a theremin is not only a beautifully expressive instrument, but it's a terribly simple circuit. Right. You know, when did Bob, how old was Bob Moe when he made his first one? Yeah, like 16 or something. Yeah, and, and he, he taught himself how to do it. Right. This is the problem, and this is the dialogue, and this was some of the stuff that we were wrestling with when we were, um, when we were getting started and learning what this world of ours was going to be. And we grapple with the problems, and it could be tremendously difficult for us. All right, so uh, the Tascam DR-07 Mark II decided the card was full now, and also maybe the battery wasn't so good, and maybe I didn't want to record anymore. And so we left the truck behind, and we have moved into the studio area of my mountain hideaway and uh, to talk a little bit more. So why don't uh, you continue? Uh, what I recall is that you and Nick Rothwell knew everything, and that well, was the this point. Well, this was... <laughs> The point I was trying to make was that there were, in these early mailing lists, a lot of the language and a lot of the tropes that we take for granted these days were still being decided. They were um, uh, being argued about and sort of, sort of codified for the first time. And the one that Nick and I always used to have a lot of fun with was this idea of, I need a new synthesizer. I don't know what I need. <laughs> But I need a new synthesizer. And, and the, 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 the classic, I think, joke that Nick used to make was something to the effect of, I'm not sure what I want to do right now. Do I want to get a pet iguana or do I want to take up gardening? Right. And the idea was that we had forgotten, I think, to some extent that while uh, these things can be fun toys and while they can give us, I guess, a... Uh, you know, a sense of, of joy and creativity just from messing around with them. They really are also tools for a, for a real creative purpose. And if you say you need a new synthesizer, but you have no idea what it is that you need, basically what you're saying is you've run out of inspiration and you're looking to buy an artificial means of boosting that inspiration. And nowadays, you can get away with that, I think, a little bit in the era of iOS apps, which cost, you know, a grand total of $10. Right. Uh, but, you know, in the days when people were throwing around hundreds or thousands of dollars, uh, you really had to have a sense of, uh, you really had to have a sense of what you needed something for before you got it. Unless you were sort of philosophically saying, I feel like jumping off a cliff and I'm sort of curious as to whether I can learn to fly before I hit the ground. Well, I think that was some of it, though. I mean, and, and that was actually some of the fun was uh, was doing that j jump. At least it was for me. Although I have to admit that recently I uh, picked up a compilation album by this guy, Charles Cohen, who is uh, Pittsburgh, I think, based, or maybe Philadelphia-based synthesis. Well, if he was in Pittsburgh, he wasn't there when I was there. Uh, he's been around for ages because he has one of the original... Um, Buchla music easels. Oh, excuse and me. And he has like hand built a couple of little extra bits onto it, but otherwise he's been using the same instrument and only that instrument forever. And it's been a real joy for me to kind of learn about his practice and learn about how he is able to take this very, you know, relatively simple piece of gear and find endless inspiration out of it, apparently, because he's still doing it, still with the same machine and the same little bits of gear. It's pretty wild. Well, that was actually something which I sort of enjoyed following in, really throughout my career, is finding people who would choose a particular a particular synthesizer, really, and, and live with it and get, get really good. Um, the... Uh, the, probably the most famous example would be Vangelis, who, you know, he messed with samplers a little bit and he had other stuff in his rig, but he really was, you know, the master of the Yamaha CS80. Right. And he had six of them because you needed six in order to have two that were working at any given time. <laughs> 
love those instruments. I don't know what it is about me and, and, and instruments that were just horribly temperamental. But hey, there you go. Uh, but And then another example was, um, I, I, are you familiar with Anthony Phillips, one of the original members of Genesis? He was, no. he was, this is a, a story that everyone should know. The, the original band Genesis got together in high school and the four original members were Peter Gabriel, uh, Tony Banks, um, Mike Rutherford, and uh, uh, this guy named Anthony Phillips. And Anthony Phillips was the original uh, guitarist and he plays on the, on the first two Genesis albums. He plays on Genesis to Revelation and Trespass, but he developed crippling stage fright. And uh, Anthony ended up finding that he could make a living as a musician only doing studio work. He did uh, a library work for um, for TV stations oh, and for movie right, right. Uh, uh, for movie companies and that sort of thing. He did soundtracks for some documentaries and that sort of thing. He put out a whole series of uh, a whole series of albums um, and he was he's one of these people you just hate because he was good at everything. Uh, he played guitar. He played any number of string instruments. He played keyboards very well. Um, he was the sort of person who would release an album of solo 12-string guitar pieces, and then the very next album he released the following year would be solo grand piano. And they'd both be great. And you just hated the guy. But his whole thing was he didn't have a lot of money. He had a, a studio in a barn. Right. and would record this beautiful stuff. He had a, a rickety old piano and a, a huge collection of string instruments, but he owned a polymog. And the polymog, again, very heavy, very temperamental instrument, but very expressive when you played it. And he is the only person I know of who actually would do things like solo polymog improvisations where he would do nothing but play polymog and work the timbre as he played to create these amazing uh, uh, tr sounds. And if you go back earlier to the days when synthesizers were tremendously rare and expensive, the 60s, you would have entire albums where it would be one person and one instrument. Um, there, you know, you, so you had everything from the famous people like Walter Carlos and his Moog or Dick Hyman and his Moog uh, and, uh, you know, the early stuff that was being done with uh, Morton Sabotnik on right. the early Buchla systems. Right. Uh, but then you would have, you know, Star Drive and his album Intergalactic Trot. <laughs> have you never heard of Star Drive? No. Well... Can't imagine why not. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember what the guy behind Star Drive, what his name was, but he, he had a one-of-a-kind synthesizer that used, I believe, a very early scanning multiplexing keyboard. So he had polyphony years before anybody else did. Oh, wow. And he did this album of, you know, fairly tacky stuff, but it was all done with this one fairly customized instrument that he really knew inside and out. And you would have... People like that. And I think to some extent, in the early days of the E Music L groups and the people who hung around doing that kind of thing, that kind of virtuosity, where we're talking physical dexterity and headspace combining so that you have the artist and the tool really interacting with one another the way Itzhak Perlman plays the violin or the way Mstislav Rostropovich played the cello or the way, you know, Ivo Pogorelich played the grand piano. This, there, this was the instrument. And nobody ever felt that, you know, Perlman never felt he had to go out and, and get something to go with his violin. The violin was what he used. But right. then you fall into the trap that electronics dies. Yeah. And this really? is this is what I came back to with, with the mixture Troutonium. A very difficult to use instrument, very delicate, temperamental, and if you didn't have a real reason to keep one working, they went away. And one of the things that I look out for, and this is a topic for an entire other podcast, is looking at how people interact with instruments today and seeing what is ephemeral what is not going to be here in two years that people are relying on right now? And what is here now that was here 20 years ago and will likely still be here in 20 years? As much as I hate to say it, Uncle Bob, when he put a Hammond organ keyboard on the first Moog, 
he set a trend in motion that it had a lot of people have complained about, but which may be the saving of the synthesizer as a melodic performance instrument. As long as it's married to something with centuries of pedagogy, like the organ keyboard, it's not going to go away. Or at least it's not going to be treated as purely... A noisemaker. Yeah, or, or a, a novelty. Exactly. It's not a novelty act that, that we get tired of and toss out because it does have that, that instrumentality that comes with having a keyboard. And, right. and really this is this is a whole other this is a whole other topic for conversation. The idea of the interaction between well, it's actually how I got to where I am today. I wrote a, a huge treatise on E Music L called the Man Machine Interface, which was an, a 1988 vintage look at how people had been interacting with electronics f- for the past hundred years, and how we got technology to work, and how you know some ideas go away and don't come back, and some ideas have this way of, of, of resurfacing. You know, th- we talked about the theremin, the other one that, that comes up every once in a while, although not nearly as often as the Andes Martineau. Uh-huh, right. And um, I guess it's, um, uh, help me out here, British module manufacturer, they design huge modules, uh, analog, analog solutions, analog... So analog the, analog solutions, uh, British British maker. Well, there's two. There's analog solutions and analog systems. And analog. I can't remember which one is which. Yeah, neither do I. But one of them makes a makes a, a, a controller keyboard called the French Connection. Okay. And the French Connection is a f- standard four octave synth keyboard with CVs in and uh-huh. out, but it's also got Martineau controls on it. Is so that, that little ring thing yeah, on the string. Because the way the the way the Andes Martineau worked in the old days was it didn't actually have moving keys. It had a, a, a sculpture, a wooden sculpture of a keyboard to tell you where you were. You put your finger through a ring, and as you moved your hand up and down the keyboard, the, the ring was on a string that went through pulleys that changed the pitch of the instrument. So if you moved your hand to the right, the pitch went up. Right. If you moved your hand to the left, the pitch went down, and you would have this very beautiful, fluid keyboard technique that was rooted in the old black and whites, so you right. could tell where you were going, but didn't sound anything like a piano or a clavichord or or a harpsichord or anything along those lines. And the French Connection basically brought back the Andes Martineau's uh, user interface right. with the ring that you could put th- your finger through while you played the actual keyboard or instead of the actual keyboard that generated a control vo- voltage as you moved the string around and the little button on the left that you would push to actuate notes, which is what you did for the Andes Martineau. Uh, if something feels good, people are going to find a way to come back to it. Right. And, and the, thing that I, the thing that I have always been fascinated by and will probably forever be fascinated by in the technology side of this is what people like to touch right. when it comes to music. What people, how people like to interact. Because the one piece of technology that's in this business that is was here first and will be here at the end and is for all of that the crotchetiest fussiest most difficult to categorize and most difficult to keep operating on an even keel is the human being (laughs) you know people are tremendously nuanced and very difficult to, to force into pigeonholes but they're the ones who ultimately end up using these instruments well, they tend to fall apart in an ingracious ways as well, <laughs> well as my stack of prescription medications there will tell. Well, but <laughs> so we actually got got to your kind of talking about um, the the way that we used this early internet to explore concepts. That first of all, I don't think many people. I think it's the kind of it's the kind of concept that requires a conversation. Mm-hmm. This isn't generally something you're going to, you know, sit in your log cabin and after twenty years of deep thought, come up with stuff. It has to it has to exist within a kind of a penelope of different views and different um, beliefs about what's important and what's not, and, and and that sort of like ends up coming together to create a concept. 
Well, let me give you a good example. Um, there was, in 1989, uh, a conversation that was going on on, it was either on the Usenet News Group, Rec Music Synth, or it was on Music L, one or the other. But uh, two people, I don't even remember who they were, uh, got into a fight, and they were flaming each other and uh, saying some, some pretty unforgivable things. And someone finally, just in desperation, at, as, as this conversation had reached fever pitch, just said, look, you know, you really wouldn't be talking to me that way if I was sitting in the room with you. Right. And I read that, but a little bell went off in my head. <laughs> and I, I posted a, a message following up on whatever news group it was. And I said, what would we say to each other if we were in the same room? Would anybody like to get together with me and sit in the same room for a while? And there was this resounding silence for about, <laughs> for about a day. For about a day, there was a resounding silence. And then one person, I don't know who was first, I think it was Nick Rothwell, said, you know, I'd love to do that. I've never been to America. Yeah, can we get together? And then Carl Brenner, who was, um, he was at uh, 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 Columbia, one of the, one of the universities in, in, uh, in, in Manhattan said, yeah, fly to New York, Nick. I'll drive with you down to, down to, down to Pittsburgh. And then uh, Dan Barrett uh, of Blazemonger uh, jumped in and said, sure, you know, Maryland's not that far away. I can get to Pittsburgh. It shouldn't be that hard. And uh, there were there were some people who couldn't make it. Pete Yadlowski thought he would come up from Charlottesville, but he was never able to make it. Jim Lee stopped in to say hello. Uh, but then, and, and we had people who, uh, you know, Adam Shaptak, who is now known as one of the creative folks at Audio Damage. That was how he got into the community. He wasn't able to come to that first meeting, but he spent sent himself virtually by sending MIDI files. <laughs> and there were eight of us. Uh, John Rossi III uh, came from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, he connected in via Milnet. Um, and who else was there? Kurt Geisel. I miss you, Kurt. If you're out there, call me, would you? Kurt, Kurt was a, 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 a computer wunderkind. He was still in college. He was maybe 20 years old. His basement had one of everything when it came to personal computers. He was an expert at coding on the IBM PC. He had a Mac II. He had an Amiga running bars and pipes. Of course. Um, he had an Atari. And he had an Apple II with a chip burner. And he had a Matrix 12. And he had a Polymog in perfect working order oh, wow. that he heated his parents' house with during the winter. <laughs> Seriously, he left it on all the time because if you turn them off, they, they'd go unstable. Yeah. So from October to April, the thing was on and it heated the house. <laughs> um, anyway, eight of us got together. Um, I'm probably forgetting somebody, but it'll, it'll, it'll come back to me. Oh, Dean Swan, who uh, uh, now does uh, data analysis for a company up uh, in upstate New York near the Canadian border. Um, and he was he was uh, a real firebrand. He loved arguing, uh, not just for the sake of arguing, but because he, he, he couldn't abide uh, bad mental processes. He liked things to be clear and clean. And we got together in Pittsburgh, and people brought gear, and we were together for two weeks, and we recorded an album, which is, by the way, still available on CD Baby. Uh, it's called It was called Bandwidth, and the, the name of the group was Team Metley. Um, which, by the way, uh, everybody wonders, did he name it after him? It was actually a redemption of an insult. Uh, to be a member of Team Metley, if you were in the physics department at the University of Pittsburgh in the 1980s, meant that you were somebody who failed your qualifying exams. <laughs> okay. Because I... I was actually going to ask, I was going to ask... Uh, does it feel weird to have named this thing after yourself? It was, no, I understand. Well, it was better. it was just it was it was a sort of a redemption of this this view that the scientific community had of me as a failure, sure. uh, which was funny as hell since I actually went on to do a pretty good job of it before I, I changed careers. But uh, that's another story. Several other stories. Maybe an entire anthology. Anyway, <laughs> um, the point is, we got these eight guys together. We spent two weeks together, and we ate a lot of food. We drank a lot of beer. We recorded. An album it was about 43 minutes and when you go back and listen to it there's some stuff in it that's dated but it's really pretty and i'm really proud of it 
And I wish more people heard it. One thing which I still haven't mastered is marketing myself. But bandwidth was the first of the team MetLife sessions. And what ended up happening was for the next 10 years, every two years or so, I would get a bunch of these guys together and we would hang out and make music. And sometimes it worked really well and sometimes it didn't. And we got three albums out of the, out of the, the, the process. Um, bandwidth was the first. It was recorded in 90 and not released until 93. Because guess what? Back in the early 90s, if you wanted to put out CDs, it was about a $5,000 proposition. Yeah, it was outrageous. It was one, bandwidth was one of the first completely independently funded CDs. And it was, it was expensive. Um, then uh, in 95, uh, I was about to release Ballistic, which was the second album when you and I met. Right. With the, the album had just arrived from the press, and you got one of the first copies because yes, you I came did. to visit me in Tallahassee. Right. And I cracked open one of the crates <laughs> and let you have it. Um, and then the last album, Beneath Stars, actually you played on the last little bit of and helped me master and get out the door years after it was over. Yep. And that was the last, <laughs> another conversation, the, the evolution of... of uh, uh, physical product in the world of recorded music from being absolutely essential to being something that you build furniture out of. Right. Um, my last fully produced duplicated run of a thousand CDs. Uh, I'm never doing that again. Uh, but, but the point was that in amongst the music and the recording and everything else, there was this fantastic set of dialogue. And I'd like to think that it got folded back into the more general dialogue of the creative community that there is something vital and something important and something beautiful that happens when we all get together in a room and we talk. And I don't think people in this industry talk nearly enough. I think everybody's very content to troll and flame one another from the safety of their homes and to not set foot outside of their forums and their social media. People create on their own and live and die on their own. And one of the things that I love about the community is that against that tremendous tide of isolation and loneliness and apathy, there are these groups of people who still insist on getting together and talking to each other and creating together. It's so important. Um, and really, I think all of the best work that I have done in my long and very spotty career it has been um, in concert with like-minded people. I've done a few solo pieces that I'm kind of proud of, but far and away they're outnumbered by the stuff that I've done working with people that I love. While you make the joke about Team Metley being related to this failure vector in school, I would say that you were sort of the ringleader of that group. For a couple of reasons. First of all, you're an engaged and engaging person in an environment where there are an awful lot of extremely shy or introverted people. And so by being willing to say, let's do it, come on, let's go, that was actually a rarity because most people are like, well, I, I'd say that, but then people would look at me. Right? <laughs> well, you know, you know that, that you're, you're you're being very kind. Um, I've always looked at it as as basically being a uh, a babbling idiot um, with with fortunately a, a, an enthusiastic streak. I have always been interested in the interactions of people. People are fascinating. People are, what novel was it? It was Illuminatus, where somebody says the most the most weird, messed up, impossible to pigeonhole, getting back to the same idea, the, the most weird, impossible, messed up, difficult to pigeonhole thing in the universe full of difficult things is the individual human being. And watching how individual human beings rub together and how they produce conflict and how they produce agreement is just fascinating to me. And music is the way in which I prefer to do that because music is naturally collaborative. And all of the projects that I have done have been collaborative to some extent or another. Um, some of them have died horribly because of interpersonal conflicts. Some of them I've actually managed to wrap up with a certain degree of grace. But that's always, that's always going to be my theme. Uh, you know, in the 1990s, it was Team Metley from, from 90 until 99. In the 2000s, uh, it was the Different Skies 
concerts. Right. Uh, you know, 10 years of getting these groups of people from all over the world to come together for one week on one stage and write music together. Yeah, Nine for those of you who don't know, they, they were held down in Arcosanti and were, it was an amazing thing to put together. It was, it's clearly, uh, you know, it's one of those things that's going to be sort of of historical importance, I think. And, the electronic music world. Well, I'd like to think so. And some good music came out of it, which is available out there, actually. Um, various of the festivals have been preserved in varying degrees of polish. One of these days, the, the 2010 festival, which everybody agrees was the best, uh, except the folks who weren't there, <laughs> sorry, uh, will get released. Actually, Paul Vinook Jr. has a has a beautiful recording of our live concert from that night, including the uh, the encore, which basically consists of three notes and then me screaming, "Rain!" Because <laughs> what we couldn't see was there was a thunderstorm no. coming up over the valley, and it was behind us, and the audience actually saw it coming at us. It was it was a pretty amazing experience, <laughs> um, and uh, we we learned just how fast you can tarp a stage, but. Uh, <laughs> That, again, 10 years, every year, getting a group of people together yeah. for, for these. And there, there are a bunch of great different Sky stories. But the central theme is people who normally don't interact or who interact in a very small, controlled environment, stepping out of their comfort zone and opening themselves up to an extent to others and saying, this is what I am. This is how I create is there something here that you can use? Is there something here that you can work with? Right. And when it w when it hit, it was it it was beautiful. It was magical. And I, you know, the biggest cliche of my career, the the one catchphrase that I've used over and over again for going on twenty five years now is, I do not collect synthesizers anymore. Now I collect synthesists. <laughs> and and I'm just the 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 the. Biggest treasure in in my life is the friends I've made, and the 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 collaborations and the creative partnerships that have come out of it. Some have worked well, some have worked poorly. There have been ones that, you know, one shining moment of brilliance that produced a fantastic album, followed by decades of stony silence because <laughs> the people involved won't talk to each other anymore. <laughs> Um, and then there have been, you know, other collaborations uh, that keep coming up again and again and producing little bits of things that sneak out as creative commons or, you know, on, on a net label somewhere and that people, you know, drop me an email and say, you know, Mike, where are you these days? I'd love to hear more because I just, I just found Shriek Void or Triangulum or Curiosa Positronica or Metric or Eocene on the web right. and it was like what are you doing nowadays and and it's always nice because that always gives me the opportunity if the other person's a musician to say oh no what are you doing nowadays <laughs> you, you, you got a, got a little free time <laughs> and then if, if they're smart they hang up right. and, if, and if they're not smart then it's another mind spiral project <laughs> um so i want to so use net doesn't exist anymore. Well, it does, but it's I now mean, completely... Sort of, yeah. Well, no, now it's completely overrun by spam bots. Right. The, people discovered that you could you could post to Usenet, and literally when the spam bot was invented, within the space of six months, the signal-to-noise ratio went through the basement and people stopped using it. Right. And um, mail lists are sort of like passe at this point. I think, I think what it is, is, the mail list is where like what I like to call nano communities live. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, from in sort of like the broader view, they're not really, they're, they're not really the, the locus of, of things. Now things tend to be Facebook stuff and Twitter stuff and, and forums. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you don't really engage in those very much. No, I hate them. Because the, the tendency is, if you open the door too wide, um, you, you will increase the number of worthwhile people walking through the door by a small but measurable percentage. And you'll increase the number of yahoos who are looking for somebody to make noise at by a much, much larger percentage. Mm -hmm. And I know that makes me sound terribly arrogant and snobbish. And I'm sorry, but have you ever tried to get real 
intellectual satisfaction from a discussion thread on Facebook. It doesn't happen very often. It right. happens, but it doesn't happen very often. And Twitter is worse. You know, uh, it was um, George Bernard Shaw who said, any philosophy that can be put in a nutshell belongs there. <laughs> and as cool as it is for, you know, for somebody like Tim Walters to write a super collider patch that fits in a tweet, right? that's about all they're really good for, is, yeah. is, is I, 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 I am not convinced that 140 characters is some magical, mystical gateway to enlightenment and <laughs> conciseness of thought. I believe in limitations. I believe that if you have infinite options, you get paralyzed. Yeah. But 140 characters... It's hard to find Buddha there. Huh? It's it's a little hard to find Buddha there. You can find boot. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> So the the mailing list still has a use. I mean, I still run the Different Skies mailing list, which is for enthusiasts of of the 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 the, the concert series, and the uh, and the people who participated in it and hope to participate in it again. Fat chance, um, <laughs> and 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 I'm a member of some others. Uh, the Beyond EM mailing list was one that did very well for about a decade. These days, it's very very quiet uh, because people are finding other ways to engage. But I'm not sure how effective those other ways are because the other place where you can create focus, and this is a, a danger, one of the ways in which you can create focus and dialogue is if you own the forum. And a lot of the things that you're seeing now are forums that are owned by record labels. So the, probably the, the, the one that's best known to followers of ambient music in, in the States would be Hypnos Records right. out of uh, Mike Griffin's label out of, mm -hmm. out of Portland. Great people, great labels, but they're to some extent, fortunately not a lot because Mike is a very egalitarian guy, uh, there is some extent that the, the intent is at least, if not for Hypnos alone, that the people who are out there are doing commercial CD releases right. or whatever. Music Zite was the same way. Uh, and then you also run into the problem, this was true 30 years ago, it's still true now, of a, a sort of elitism that can creep in with a certain community. If you, if you have a group of people who have hung around long enough and they have, you know, they've made their bones in a particular forum, they, they, they can not always be terribly pleasant. Um, there are pro audio forums out there that I read professionally right. that uh, I don't post to because mm -hmm. I have no particular interest in uh, joining the, that dialogue. It's interesting to watch. Some some of it is very useful. Some of it's very worthwhile. I have nothing to say to these people. Right. So it's an ongoing thing, and it's going to keep evolving. the 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 problem is that that right now technology has us by the nose. And it is dragging us. And we can only control where we end up to a certain extent because to some extent the technology is dictating where we end up. It's if something is new and exciting and we can make it better and faster and smarter, we do it. And we often don't realize the consequences for things like community and dialogue until long after the barn door is open and the right. horse is gone. Yeah. You know, we had no idea. Can you imagine what sort of a dialogue we would have had in the electronic creativity community if we had smartphones on day one? <laughs> if everyone in the world could suddenly jump into the into the, the, the conversation at once? I think it was a blessing that the conversation started narrow right. and gradually right. broadened. And I'm I'm not ashamed of the fact that I was one of the first. I'm I'm grateful. I'm blessed. I'm lucky. I'm not ashamed. It was a wonderful thing and it was a wonderful time. And I do miss it sometimes, but nostalgia let's be honest, the people who are doing the really cool stuff with analog modular synthesizers these days are not the people who refuse to buy anything that was built after 1975. Right. I mean Analog synthesis is not about nostalgia anymore. Right. We have reclaimed what made analog synthesis great. The immediacy, the tactile feedback, the sense of impermanence, the, the sand painting nature of the 
analog workflow when you have patch cables and potentiometers and switches. And I mean, look at, at you know, yeah, okay. Moog's stuff was great. When I was living in Tallahassee, the husband of the woman who ran the daycare center where my infant daughter spent her first year of life was a former Moog technician. Mm -hmm. He worked for Bob Moog in Buffalo before he and his wife moved to Tallahassee. And he had a customized Moog System 15 in his basement covered in sawdust. And uh, a friend of mine drove all the way to Tallahassee to buy it off of him, yeah. only to get it home and discover that a lot of the modules didn't work. And the ones that this guy had custom designed were often wired in ways that anyone who had ever read Horowitz and Hill can tell you that a circuit shouldn't be built, <laughs> you know, including, you know, capacitors backwards right, and, right. you know, voltage divider networks that were that were grounded in two points and <laughs> just <laughs> things oh, that man. things, you know, brilliant ideas on paper, wonderful looking face plates and behind those. Uh, <laughs> and the, the point is that you now you've got I mean, I mean, just I, I'm looking over here at this beautiful tip top uh, skiff. And you've got stuff by mutable instruments oh. and make noise. And these people aren't looking backwards. No. It's, it, they've taken the really great stuff and they've, and they've added stuff that you couldn't do outside the 21st century. And what I love is that that was all done because of dialogue. You know, they figured out what was needed. Nobody who builds these modern modules sits in his basement and doesn't talk to anybody. That's really true. And, you know, I certainly see that when I go to these synth meetups. I was up in Portland um, visiting uh, the Control Voltage store and just a stream of people coming in. And there's something about... You know, we gather around these instruments and two people who've never... I mean, I'm, I'm just standing there like twirling a knob and random people would walk in, look at the knob that I'm twirling and either say, oh, you know, I've got one of those and it's sweet. Or I've got one of those and I wish I would have got this. Or, yeah, that's a cool looking module. What do you know about it? Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's an interesting community because there is that kind of interest in the, in discussion and all so well mike thank you so much for taking your time to uh to talk to me and to talk to to the podcasters i've got a bunch of other things i want to talk to you we're going to have another discussion where we go back to distribution methods and talk mm -hmm. about the cassette culture mm -hmm. um i want to do that as well as like the early cd culture which is it was interesting that you brought that up. I I had forgotten about that, but that was how that was how we first started sort of like working on music together. Was mm -hmm. I helped uh, masters the, uh, the second CD? I think it was. Well, no, it was the third. And um, the uh, you also did a lot of work rescuing the Osma project. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ozma, a huge and silent place, still available at cdbaby.com. <laughs> um, sorry, guys, I got to get plugs in. I sell maybe three CDs a year these days, but, you know, anything that helps. Oh, I remember the other thing I did was I, I worked with Nick on his CD. Yeah, uh, right. the, the Cassiel that. CD. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I am. I have the, the, the actual, the singular honor of being the only person ever to have released a physical product that has Nick Rothwell's music on it. Cassiel's Listen Move album was an Anatomic City uh, release. That's right. That was a ph phenomenal album, too. I, I've, I've been very lucky in the people that I've worked yeah, with. Yeah, no kidding. And, and we've got lots of stuff we can talk about. We've right. been going on, and we could go on for hours. Yeah, But indeed. I had a blast, and, and I really appreciate your, your having me out to talk and, and, and to, to share this stuff. Um, because this is what I do. This is dialogue. Yeah. And it's so much fun. And uh, if certainly if anybody has any comments, positive or negative, you know, Darwin will forward them to me. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, I, I wish I could say that I had a comprehensive website of a lot of this history and, and, and so forth ready for you to go to when uh, you hear this podcast. Alas, I do not, but it is in the process of being updated for the first time in many years. Um, if you are the sort to be patient, uh, over this summer of 2014, AtomicCity.com will gradually come back together. I'm going to have a WordPress blog and various other things happening, uh, including some uh, 
word about future concerts. I will put in one quick plug. I will be playing at the Fort Collins Museum of Discovery on uh, Thursday, June the 19th, 2014 at 7 p.m. They have a, an organization that's worth an entire conversation in and of itself called the Dome Club which is an informal gathering of creators and consumers of planetarium-style 360-degree immersive video, oh, nice. and where they show experimental uh, short films, and they do work with 360-degree camera and sound. Oh, nice. uh, it, the, 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 it's a beautiful little theater. They just built it. It's less than a year old, and they're looking for creative people. And I'm going to do a concert. I'm going to have a, I don't know whether it will be solo or whether I'll be playing uh, with, you know, putting together a Mind Spiral group. But uh, it's June 19th, and uh, I'm really hoping that if you are in the northern Colorado area that you make a trip. Uh, FCMOD.org is the website. And even if you don't make my concert, if you're in the area, it's a great little museum that is looking for creative people to work with and uh, to build community. And that's what it's always going to come back to. That's fantastic. Thanks a lot, Mike. And uh, we'll talk again really soon. Thanks, Darwin. And there it is. Uh, as you can see, I'm, I had to make all kinds of quality compromises in order to capture the conversation, including some pretty radically icky uses of noise reduction plugins. Never, never a good idea, but uh, necessary in this case. So I hope that you can get past the quality issues and actually enjoy the podcast because it was really interesting and fun to talk with Mike Metley. I want to again thank everyone that is helping out as well as everyone that's listening in on the podcast. And I hope you continue to enjoy it. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or if you want to throw a Rotten Tomatoes at Mike Metley, feel free to email me, ddg at cycling74.com. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you next week.